it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Our first story this evening comes from W.F. Harvey, an English writer of short stories, most noted for his work in the macabre and horror genre. Among his best-known stories are August Heat and The Beast with Five Fingers, described by many as minor masterpieces. And we begin tonight with his story, Across the Moors. It really was most unfortunate. Peggy had a temperature of nearly a hundred, and a pain in her side, and Mrs. Workington Bancroft knew that it was appendicitis. But there was no one whom she could send for the doctor. James had gone with the jaunting car to meet her husband, who had at last managed to get away for a week's shooting. Adolf, she'd sent to the Eversham's only half an hour before, with a note for Lady Eva. The cook could not manage to walk, even if dinner could be served without her. Kate, as usual, was not to be trusted. And there remained Miss Craig. Of course, you must see that Peggy is really ill, said she, as the governess came into the room in answer to her summons. The difficulty is that there is absolutely no one whom I can send for the doctor. Mrs. Workington Bancroft paused. She was always willing that those beneath her should have the privilege of offering the services which it was her right to command. So, perhaps, Miss Craig, she went on, you wouldn't mind walking over to Tebbit's farm. I hear there's a Liverpool doctor staying there. Of course I know nothing about him, but we must take the risk, and I expect he'll be only too glad to be earning something during his holiday. It's nearly four miles away, I know, and I'd never dream of asking you, if it was not, that I dread appendicitis so. Very well, said Miss Craig. I suppose I must go, but I don't know the way. Oh, you can't miss it said Mrs. Workington Bancroft, in her anxiety temporarily forgiving the obvious unwillingness of her governess's consent. You follow the road across the moor for two miles, until you come to Redman's Cross. You turn to the left there, and follow a rough path that leads through a large plantation, and Tebbit's farm lies just below you in the valley. Oh, and take Pontiff with you, she added, as the girl left the room. There's absolutely nothing to be afraid of, but I expect you'll feel happier with the dog. Well, miss, said the cook, when Miss Craig went into the kitchen to get her boots, which had been drying by the fire. Of course she knows best, but but I don't think it's right that after all that's happened for the mistress to send you across the moors on a night like this. It's not as if the doctor could do anything for Miss Margaret if you do bring him. Every child is like that once in a while. He'll only say, put her to the bed, and she's there already. Oh, I don't see what there is to be afraid of, cook, said Miss Craig as she laced her boots unless you believe in ghosts. Oh, I'm not so sure about that. Anyhow, I don't like sleeping in a bed where the sheets are too short for you to pull them over your head. But don't you be frightened, miss. It's my belief that their bark is worse than their bite. But though Miss Craig amused herself for some minutes by trying to imagine the bark of a ghost, a thing altogether different from the classical ghostly bark, she didn't feel entirely at ease. She was naturally nervous, and living as she did in the hinterland of the servants' hall, she'd heard vague details of true stories that were only myths in the drawing room. The very name of Redmond's Cross sent a shiver through her. It must have been the place where that horrid murder was committed. She'd forgotten the tale, though. She remembered the name. Well, her first disaster came soon enough. Pontiff, who was naturally slow-witted, took more than five minutes to find out that it was only the governess he was escorting. But once the discovery had been made, he promptly turned tail, paying not the slightest heed to Miss Craig's feeble whistle. And then, to add to her discomfort, the rain came. Not in heavy drops, but driving in sheets of thin spray that blotted out what few landmarks there were upon the moor. They were very kind at Tebbit's farm. The doctor had gone back to Liverpool the day before, but... Mrs. Tebbit gave her hot milk and turf cakes, and had ordered her reluctant son to show Miss Craig a shorter path onto the moor, one that avoided the large wood. Oh, he was a monosyllabic youth, but his presence was cheering, and she felt the night doubly black when he left her at the last gate. She trudged on wearily, 
her thoughts had already gone back to the almost exhausted theme of the bark of ghosts, when she heard steps on the road behind her that were at least material. Next minute, the figure of a man appeared. Miss Craig was relieved to see that the stranger was a clergyman. He raised his hat. Oh, I believe we're both going in the same direction, he said. Perhaps I may have the pleasure of escorting you. She thanked him. Oh, it is a rather weird at night, she went on. And what with all the tales of ghosts and bogies that one hears from the country people, I've ended by being half afraid myself. Oh, I can understand your nervousness, he said, especially on a night like this. I used to, at one time, feel the same, for my work often meant lonely walks across the moor to farms which are only reached by rough tracks difficult enough to find even in the daytime. And you never saw anything to frighten you. Nothing uh, immaterial, I mean. Well, I can't really say that I did, but I had an experience eleven years ago which served as a turning point in my life since you seem to be now in much the same state of mind I was then, I'll tell you. The time of year was late September. I'd been over to Westendale to see an old woman who was dying, and then, just as I was about to start on my way home, word came to me of another of my parishioners who'd been suddenly taken ill only that morning. It was after seven when at last I started. A farmer saw me on the way, turning back when I reached the moor road. The sunset the previous evening had been one of the most lovely I ever remember seeing. The whole vault of heaven had been scattered with flakes of white cloud, tipped with rosy pink like the strewn petals of a full-blown rose. But that night, all was changed. The sky was an absolutely dull slate color, except in one corner of the west where a thin rift showed the last saffron tint of the sullen sunset. As I walked, stiff and footsore, my spirit sank. It must have been the marked contrast between the two evenings, the one so lovely, so full of promise. The corn was still out in the field, spoiling for fine weather, and the other, so gloomy, so sad, with all the dead weight of autumn and winter days to come. And then added to this sense of heavy depression came another different feeling, which I surprised myself by recognizing as fear. I do not know why I was afraid. The moors lay on either side of me, unbroken except for a straggling line of turf shooting butts that stood within a stone's throw of the road. The only sound I heard for the last half hour was the cry of the startled grouse. Go back, go back, go back. But yet the feeling of fear was there, affecting a low center of my brain through some little-used physical channel. I buttoned my coat closer and tried to divert my thoughts by thinking of next Sunday's sermon. I had chosen to preach on Job. There's much in the old-fashioned notion of the book, apart from all the subtleties of the higher criticism that appeals to country people, the loss of herds and crops, the breakup of the family. I would not have dared to speak had not I too been a farmer. My own glebe land had been flooded three weeks before, and I suppose I stood to lose as much as any man in the parish. As I walked along the road, repeating to myself the first chapter of the book, I stopped at the twelfth verse. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Now the thought of the bad harvest, and that is an awful thought in these valleys, vanished. I seemed to gaze into an ocean of infinite darkness. Now I'd often use, with the Sunday glibness of the tired priest, whose duty it is to preach three sermons in one day, the old simile of the chessboard. God and the devil were the players, and we were helping one side or the other. But until that night, I'd not thought of the possibility of my being only a pawn in the game, that God might throw away, that the game might be won reach the place where we are now. I remember it by that rough stone water trough, when a man suddenly jumped out from the roadside. He'd been seated on a heap of broken road metal. Oh, which way are you going, Governor? He said. I knew from the way he spoke that the man was a stranger. There are many at this time of the year who come from the south, trampling northwards with the ripening corn. I told him my destination. We will go along together, he replied. 
it was too dark to see much of the man's face, but what little I made out was coarse and brutal. Then he began the half-menacing whine I know so well. He'd trampled miles that day. He'd had no food since breakfast, and that was only a crust. Oh, give us a copper, he said. It's only for a night's lodging. Well, he was whittling away with a big clasp knife at an ash steak he'd taken from some hedge. The clergyman broke off. Oh, are those the lights of your house? he said. We're nearer than I expected, but I shall have time to finish my story. I think I will, for you can run home in a couple of minutes, and I don't want you to be frightened when you're out on the moors again. So, as the man talked, he seemed to have stepped out of the very background of my thoughts. His sordid tale were the sad lies that hid a far sadder truth. He asked me the time. It was five minutes to nine. As I replaced my watch, I glanced at his face. His teeth were clenched, and there was something in the gleam of his eyes that told me at once his purpose. Now, have you ever known how long a second is? For a third of a second, I stood there facing him, filled with an overwhelming pity for myself and him, and then, without a word of warning, he was upon me. I felt nothing. A flash of lightning ran down my spine. I heard the dull crash of the ash stake, and then a very gentle patter like the sound of a far distant stream. For a minute I lay in perfect happiness, watching the lights of the house as they increased in number, until the whole heaven shone with twinkling lamps. I could not have had a more painless death. Miss Gregg looked up. The man was gone. She was alone on the moor, and she ran to the house, her teeth chattering, ran to the solid shadow that crossed and recrossed the kitchen blind. As she entered the hall, the clock on the stairs struck the hour. It was nine o'clock. Our second story this evening is the work of Robert E. Howard. An American author, famous for his pulp fiction in a diverse range of genres, almost certainly best known for his character Conan the Barbarian, is also responsible for a number of classic horror stories. We continue tonight with his tale, Old Garfield's Heart. I was sitting on the porch when my grandfather hobbled out and sank down on his favourite chair with the cushioned seat, and began to stuff tobacco in his old corncob pipe. I thought you'd been going to the dance, he said. I'm waiting for Doc Blaine, I answered. I'm going over to old man Garfield's with him. My grandfather sucked at his pipe a while before he spoke again. Old Jim Purdy bad all? Doc says he has a chance. <sighs> he was taking care of him. Joe Braxton, against Garfield's wishes, but somebody had to stay with him. My grandfather sucked his pipe noisily and watched the heat lightning playing away off up in the hills. And he said, You think old Jim's the biggest liar in this county, don't you? He tells some pretty tall tales, I admitted. Some of the things he claimed he took part in must have happened before he was born. I came from Tennessee to Texas in 1870, my grandfather said abruptly. I saw this town of Lost Knob, grew up with nothing. There wasn't even a long hut store here when I came, but old Jim Garfield was here, living in the same place he lives now. Only then it was a log cabin. He don't look a day older now than he did the first time I saw him. You've never mentioned that before, I said in some surprise. I knew you'd put it down to an old man's maunderings, he answered. Old Jim was the first white man to settle in this country. He built his cabin a good fifty miles west of the frontier. God knows how he done it. These hills swarmed with Comanches back then. Yeah, I remember the first time I ever saw him. Even then, everyone called him Old Jim. Remember him telling me the same tales he told you? How he was at the Battle of San Jacinto when he was a youngster, and how he'd rode with Ewan Cameron and Jack Hayes. Only, I believe him and you don't. 
that was so long ago, I protested. Uh, the last Indian raid through this country was in 1874, said my grandfather, engrossed in his own reminiscences. I was in on that fight, so was old Jim. I saw him knock old Yellowtail off his Mustang at 700 yards with a buffalo rifle. But before that, I was with him in a fight up near the head of Locust Creek. A band of Comanches came down Mesquita, looting and burning, rode through the hills and started back up Locust Creek, and a scout of us were hot on their heels. We ran on to them just at sundown in Mesquite Flat, killed seven of them, and the rest skinned out through the brush on foot. But three of our boys were killed. Jim Garfield got a thrust in the breast with a lance. Oh, it was an awful wound. He lay like a dead man, and it seemed sure nobody could live after a wound like that. But an old Indian came out of the bush. When we aimed our guns at him, he made the peace sign and spoke to us in Spanish. Don't know why the boys didn't shoot him in his tracks, because our blood was heated with the fighting and killing, but well, something about him made us hold our fire. He said he wasn't a Comanche, but was an old friend of Garfield's and wanted to help him. He asked us to carry Jim into a clump of mesquite and leave him alone with him, and to this day, I don't know why we did, but uh, we did. Oh, it was an awful time. The wounded moaning and calling for water. The staring corpses strewn about the camp, night coming on, and no way of knowing that the Indians wouldn't return when dark fell. We made camp right there. Because the horses were fagged out and we watched all night, but the Comanches didn't come back. I don't know what went on out in the mesquite where Jim Garfield's body lay, because I never saw that strange Indian again. But during the night I kept hearing a weird moaning that wasn't made by a dying man, and an owl hooted from midnight till dawn. When at sunrise, Jim Garfield came walking out of the mesquite, pale and haggard but alive and already the wound in his breast had closed and begun to heal. And since then, he's never mentioned that wound, nor that fight, nor the strange Indian who came and went so mysteriously. And he hasn't aged a bit. He looks now just like he did then, a man of about fifty. In the silence that followed, a car began to purr down the road, and twin shafts of light cut through the dust. That's Doc Blaine, I said. When I'll come back, I'll tell you how Garfield is. Doc Blaine was prompt with his predictions as we drove the three miles of post-oak-covered hills that lay between Lost Knob and the Garfield farm. Well, I'll be surprised to see him alive, he said. Oh, smashed up like he is. A man his age ought to have more sense than to try and break a young horse. He doesn't look so old, I remarked. Well, I'll be fifty my next birthday answered Doc Blaine. I've known him all my life, and he must have been at least fifty the first time I ever saw him. Yeah, his looks are deceiving. Old Garfield's dwelling place was reminiscent of the past. The boards of the low squat house had never known paint. Orchard fence and corrals were built of rails. Old Jim lay on his rude bed, tended crudely but efficiently by the man Doc Blaine had hired over the old man's protests. As I looked at him, I was impressed anew by his evident vitality. His frame was stooped but unwithered, his limbs rounded up with springy muscles. In his corded neck and in his face, drawn though it was with suffering, was apparent an innate virility. His eyes, though, partly glazed with pain, burned with the same unquenchable element. He's been raving, said Joe Braxton stolidly. First white man in this country, muttered old Jim, becoming intelligible. Hills no white man ever set foot in before. Ah, oh, getting too old. Have to settle down. Can't move on like I used to. Settle down here. Good country before it filled up with cowmen and squatters. Oh, I wish you and Cameron could see this country. But the Mexicans shot him, damn them. Doc Blaine shook his head. He's all smashed up inside. He won't live till daylight. And Garfield unexpectedly lifted his head and looked at us with clear eyes. Wrong, Doc, he wheezed, his breath whistling with pain. I'll live. 
What's broken bones and twisted guts? <laughs> Nothing. It's the heart that counts. Long as the heart keeps pumping, a man can't die. My heart sound. Yeah, listen to it. Feel it. He groped painfully for Doc Blaine's wrist, dragged his hand to his bosom and held it there, staring up into the doctor's face with avid intensity. Regular dynamo, ain't it? He gasped. Stronger than a gasoline engine. Blaine beckoned me. Lay your hand here, he said, placing my hand on the old man's bare breast. He does have a remarkable heart action. I noted in the light of the coal oil lamp a great livid scar in the gaunt arching breast. Such a scar as might be made by a flint-headed spear. I laid my hand directly on this scar and an exclamation escaped my lips. Under my old hand, Jim Garfield's heart pulsed, but its throb was like no other heart action I've ever observed. Its power was astounding. His ribs vibrated to its very throb. It felt more like the vibrating of a dynamo than the action of a human organ. I could feel its amazing vitality radiating from his breast, stealing up into my hand and up my arm, until my own heart seemed to speed up in response. Oh, I can't die, old Jim gasped. Not as long as my heart's in my breast. Only a bullet through the brain can kill me. Even then I wouldn't be rightly dead. As long as my heart keeps beating in my breast. Yet it ain't rightly mine, either. Uh, it belongs to Ghostman, the Lipan chief. It was the heart of a god the Lipans worshipped before the Comanches drove him out of their native hills. I knew Ghostman down on the Rio Grande. When I was with you and Cameron, I saved his life from the Mexicans once. He tied the string of ghost wampum between him and me. The wampum no man but me and him can see or feel. He came when he knowed I needed him, and I fired up on the headwaters of Locust Creek when I got this scar. Well, I was as dead as a man can be. My heart was sliced in two, like the heart of a butchered beast did. All night Ghost Man did magic, calling my ghost back from spirit land. I remember that fight a little. It was dark and gray-like, and I drifted through gray mists and heard the dead wailing pass me in the mist. But Ghostman brought me back. He took out what was left of my mortal heart and put the heart of the god in my bosom. But it's his, and when I'm through with it, he'll come for it. He kept me alive and strong for the lifetime of a man. Age can't touch me. What do I care if these fools around here call me an old liar? What I know, I know. But hark he. And his fingers became claws clamping fiercely on Doc Blaine's wrist. His old eyes, old yet strangely young, burned fierce as those of an eagle under his bushy brows. If by some mischance I should die, now or later, promise me this. Go into my bosom and take out the heart Ghost Man led me so long ago. It's his, and as long as it beats in my body, my spirit will be tied to that body. Let my head be crushed like an egg underfoot. A living thing in a rotten body. Promise? All right, I promise, replied Doc Blaine to humor him, and old Jim Garfield sat back with a whistling sigh of relief. Well, he did not die that night, nor the next, nor the next. I well remember the next day, because that was the day I had the fight with Jack Kirby. Now, people will take a good deal from a bully rather than to spill blood. Because nobody had gone to the trouble of killing him, Kirby thought the whole countryside was afraid of him. He'd bought a steer from my father, and when my father went to collect for it, Kirby told him that he paid the money to me, which was a lie. I went looking for Kirby, and came upon him in a bootleg joint, boasting of his toughness and telling the crowd that he was going to beat me up and make me say that he paid me the money, and that I had to stick it into my own pocket. When I heard him say that... I saw Red, and ran in on him with a stockman's knife, and cut him across the face and in the neck, side, breast, and belly. And the only thing that saved his life was the fact that the crowd pulled me off. Well, there was a preliminary hearing, and I was indicted on a charge of assault. My trial was set for the following term of court. Well, 
Kirby was as tough fibred as a post oak country bully ought to be, and he recovered, swearing vengeance, for he was vain of his looks, though God knows why, and I had permanently impaired them. While Jack Kirby was recovering, old man Garfield recovered too, to the amazement of everybody, especially Doc Blaine. I well remember the night Doc Blaine took me again out to old Jim Garfield's farm. I was in Shifty Collins' joint, trying to drink enough of the slop he called beer to get a kick out of it, when Doc Blaine came in and persuaded me to go with him. As we drove along the winding old road in Doc's car, I asked, Why are you so insistent I go with you on this particular night? This isn't a professional call, is it? No, he said. You couldn't kill old Jim with a post-oak mall. He's completely recovered from injuries that ought to have killed an ox. To tell you the truth, Jack Kirby is in Lost Knob, swearing he'll shoot you on sight. Well, for God's sake, I exclaimed angrily. Now everybody will think I left town because I was afraid of him. <laughs> Turn around and take me back, damn it. Ah, be reasonable, said Doc. Everybody knows you're not afraid of Kirby. Nobody's afraid of him now. His bluff's broken. And that's why he's so wild against you. But you can't afford to have any more trouble with him now. The trial's only a short time off. I laughed and said, Well, if he's looking for me hard enough, you can find me as easily at old Garfield's as in town. Because Shifty called and heard you say where you were going. And Shifty's hated me ever since I skinned him in that horse swap last fall. Yeah, he'll tell Kirby where I went. Ah, never thought of that, said Doc Blaine, worried. Ah, forget it, I advised. Kirby hasn't got guts enough to do anything but blow. But I was mistaken. Puncture a bully's vanity and you touch his one vital spot. Now, old Jim had not gone to bed when we got there. He was sitting in the room opening onto his sagging porch, the room which was at once living room and bedroom, smoking his old cob pipe and trying to read a newspaper by the light of his coal oil lamp. All the windows and doors were wide open for the coolness, and the insects which swarmed in and fluttered around the lamp didn't seem to bother him. We sat down and discussed the weather, which isn't so insane as one might suppose in a country where men's livelihood depends on sun and rain, and is at the mercy of wind and drought. The talk drifted into other kindred channels, and after some time, Doc Blaine bluntly spoke of something that hung in his mind. Jim, he said, that night I thought you were dying. You babbled a lot of stuff about your heart, and an Indian who lent you his. How much of that was delirium? None, Doc, said Garfield, pulling at his pipe. It was gospel truth. Ghostman, the life and priest of the gods of night, Replaced my dead, torn heart with one from something he worshipped. I ain't sure myself just what something is. Well, something from way back, a long way off, he said. But being a god, he can do without his heart for a while. But when I die, if I ever get my head smashed so my consciousness is destroyed, the heart must be given back to Ghostman. You mean you were in earnest about cutting out your heart? Demanded Doc Lane. Oh, it has to be, answered old Garfield. A living thing and a dead thing is opposed to nature. That's what Ghostman said. Who the devil was Ghostman? I told you, a witch doctor of the Lipens, who dwelt in this country before the Comanches came down from the State Plains and drove them south across the Rio Grande. I was a friend to him. I reckon old Ghostman is the only one left alive. Alive? Now? I don't know, confessed old Jim. I don't know whether he's alive or dead. I don't know whether he was alive when he came to me after the fight on Locust Creek, or even if he was alive when I knowed him in the southern country. Alive as we understand life, I mean. Gah, what balderdash is this? demanded Doc Blaine uneasily, and I felt a slight stirring in my hair. Outside was stillness and the stars the black shadows of the post-oak woods. The lamp cast old Garfield's shadow grotesquely on the wall, so it didn't at all resemble that of a human, and his words were strange as words heard in a nightmare. 
I know what you wouldn't understand, said old Jim. I don't understand myself, and I ain't got the words to explain them things I feel and know without understanding. The Lapins were kin to the Apaches, and the Apaches learned curious things from the Pueblos. Ghost man was, uh, that's all I can't say, alive or dead, I don't know, but he was. What's more, he is. Oh, is it you or me that's crazy? Asked Doc Blaine. Well, said old Jim, I'll tell you this much. Ghost man knew Coronado. <laughs> crazy as a loon, murmured Doc Blaine. Then he lifted his head. <laughs> What's that? Horse turning in from the road, I said. Sounds like it stopped. I stepped to the door, like a fool, and stood etched in the light behind me. I got a glimpse of a shadowy bulk I knew to be a man on a horse. Then Doc Blaine yelled, Look out! And threw himself against me, knocking us both sprawling. At the same instant I heard the smashing report of a rifle, and old Garfield grunted and fell heavily. Jack Kirby! screamed Doc Blaine. He's killed him! I scrambled up, hearing the clatter of retreating hooves, snatched old Jim's shotgun from the wall, rushed recklessly out onto the sagging porch, and let go both barrels of the fleeing shape, dim in the starlight. Well, the charge was too light to kill at that range, but the bird shot stung the horse and maddened him. He swerved, crashed headlong through a rail fence and charged across the orchard, and a peach tree limb knocked his rider out of the saddle. He never moved after he hit the ground. I ran up there and looked down at him. It was Jack Kirby right enough, and his neck was broken like a rotten branch. I let him lie and ran back to the house. Doc Blaine had stretched old Garfield out on a bench he'd dragged in from the porch. Doc's face was whiter than I'd ever seen it. Old Jim was a ghastly sight. He'd been shot with an old-fashioned forty-five seventy, and at that range the heavy ball had literally torn off the top of his head. His features were masked with blood and brains. He'd been directly behind me, poor old devil, and he'd stopped the slug meant for me. Doc Blaine was trembling, although he was anything but a stranger to such sights. Would you pronounce him dead? he asked. That's for you to say, I answered but even a fool could tell that he is dead. He is dead, said Doc Blaine in a strained, unnatural voice. Rigor mortis is already setting in, but I feel his heart. I did, and I cried out. The flesh was already cold and clammy, but beneath it, that mysterious heart still hammered away steadily, like a dynamo in a deserted house. No blood coursed through those veins, and yet the heart pounded, pounded and pounded, like the pulse of eternity. A living thing in a dead thing, whispered Doc Blaine, cold sweat on his face. This is opposed to nature. I'm going to keep the promise I made him. I'll assume full responsibility. This is too monstrous to ignore. Our implements were a butcher knife and a hacksaw. Outside only the still stars looked down on the black post oak shadows and the dead man that lay in the orchard. Inside, the old lamp flickered, making strange shadows move and shiver and cringe in the corners and glistened on the blood on the floor and the red dabbled figure on the bench. The only sound inside was the crunch of the saw edge on bone. Outside an owl began to hoot weirdly. Doc Blaine thrust a red-stained hand into the aperture he'd made and drew out a red, pulsing object that caught the lamplight. With a choked cry, he recoiled, and the thing slipped from his fingers and fell on the table. And I, too, cried out involuntarily, for it did not fall with a soft, meaty thud as a piece of flesh should fall. It thumped hard on the table. Impelled by an irresistible urge, I bent and gingerly picked up old Garfield's heart. The feel of it was brittle, unyielding, like steel or stone, but smoother than either. In size and shape, it was a duplicate of a human heart, 
but it was slick and smooth, and its crimson surface reflected the lamplight like a jewel more lambent than any ruby, and in my hand it still throbbed mightily, sending vibratory radiations of energy up my arm until my own heart seemed swelling and bursting in response. It was cosmic power, beyond my comprehension, concentrated into the likeness of a human heart. The thought came to me that here was a dynamo of life, the nearest approach to immortality that's possible for the destructible human body, the materialization of a cosmic secret more wonderful than the fabulous fountain sought for by Ponce de Leon. My soul was drawn into that unterrestrial gleam, and I suddenly wished passionately that it hammered and thundered in my own bosom in place of my paltry heart of tissue and muscle. Doc Blaine ejaculated incoherently, I wheeled. The noise of his coming had been no greater than the whispering of a night wind through the corn. There in the doorway he stood, tall, dark, inscrutable. An Indian warrior in the paint, war bonnets, breech clout and moccasins of an elder age. His dark eyes burned like fires gleaming deep under fathomless black lakes. Silently he extended his hand, and I dropped Jim Garfield's heart into it. And then, without a word, he turned and stalked into the night. But when Dot Blaine and I rushed out into the yard an instant later, there was no sign of any human being. He'd vanished like a phantom of the night, and only something that looked like an owl was flying, dwindling from sight into the rising moon. And we conclude this evening with a short story from Clark Ashton Smith, an American writer regarded as one of the big three of weird tales alongside Robert E. Howard and H.P. Lovecraft. And so we conclude this evening with his tale, The Abominations of Yonder. The sand of the desert of Yonder is not as the sand of other deserts, for Yonder lies nearest of all to the world's rim, and strange winds blowing from a pit no astronomer may hope to fathom have sown its ruinous fields with the grey dust of corroding planets, the black ashes of extinguished suns. The dark, orb-like mountains which rise from its wrinkled and pitted plain are not all its own, for some have fallen asteroids half buried in that abysmal sand. Things have crept in from nether space, whose incursion is forbid by the gods of all proper and well-ordered lands. But there are no such gods in yonder, where live the hoary genii of stars abolished and decrepit demons left homeless by the destruction of antiquated hells. It was noon of a vernal day when I came forth from that interminable cactus forest in which the inquisitors of Ong had left me, and saw at my feet the grey beginnings of yonder. I repeat it was a uh, noon on a vernal day, but in that fantastic wood I'd found no token or memory of a spring, and the swollen, fulvous, dying and half-rotten growths through which I'd pushed my way were like no other cacti, but rather bore shapes of abomination scarcely to be described. The very air was heavy with stagnant odours of decay, and leprous lichens mottled the black soil and russet vegetation with increasing frequency. Pale green vipers lifted their heads from prostrate cactus bowls and watched me with eyes of bright ochre that had no lids or pupils. These things had disquieted me for hours past, and I did not like the monstrous fungi with hewless stems and nodding heads of poisonous mauve, which grew from the sodden lips of fetid tarns, and the sinister ripples spreading and fading on the yellow water at my approach were not reassuring to one whose nerves were still taut from unmentionable tortures. Then, when even the blotched and sickly cacti became more sparse and stunted, and reels of ash and sand crept in among them, I began to suspect how great was the hatred my heresy had aroused in the priests of Ong, and to guess the ultimate malignancy of their vengeance. I will not detail the indiscretions which had led me, a careless stranger from far-off lands, into the power of those dreadful magicians and mysteriarchs who serve the lion-headed Ong. These indiscretions and the particulars of my arrest are painful to remember, 
and least of all do I like to remember the racks of dragon guts strewn with powder and adamant, on which men are stretched naked, or that unlit room with six-inch windows near the cell, where bloated corpse worms crawled in by the hundreds from a neighbouring catacomb. Sufficient to say that, after expending the resources of their frightful fantasy, my inquisitors had borne me blindfolded on camelback for incomputable hours to leave me at morning twilight in that sinister forest. I was free, they told me, to go whither I would, and in token of the clemency of Ong, they gave me a loaf of coarse bread and a leathern bottle of rank water by way of provision. It was of noon that same day that I came to the desert of Yondo. So far I had not thought of turning back, for all the horror of those rotting cacti or the evil things that dwelt among them. But now I paused, knowing the abominable legend of the land to which I come, for Yondo is a place where few have ventured wittingly and of their own accord. Fewer still have returned, babbling of unknown horrors and strange treasure, and the lifelong palsy which shakes their withered limbs, together with the mad gleam in their startling eyes, beneath widened brows and lashes, is not an incentive for others to follow. So it was that I hesitated on the verge of those ashen sands, and felt the tremor of a new fear in my wrenched vitals. It was dreadful to go on, and dreadful to go back, for I felt sure that the priests had made provision against the latter contingency. So after a little while... I went forward, singing at each step in loathly softness, and followed by certain long-legged insects that I had met among the cacti. These insects were the colour of a weak old corpse, and were as large as tarantulas. But when I turned and trod upon the foremost, a mephitic stench arose that was more nauseous even than their colour. So, for the nonce, I ignored them as much as possible. Indeed, such things were minor horrors in my predicament. Before me, under a huge sun of sickly scarlet, Yondo reached interminable as the land of a hashy stream against the black heavens. Far off, on the utmost rim, were those orb-like mountains of which I had been told. But in between were awful blanks of grey desolation, and low, treeless hills like the backs of half-buried monsters. Struggling on, I saw great pits where meteors had sunk from sight, and diverse coloured jewels that I could not name glared or glistened from the dust. There were fallen cypresses that rotted by crumbling mausoleums, on whose lichen-blooded marble fat chameleons crept with royal pearls in their mouths. Hidden by the low ridges were cities of which no stella remained unbroken, Immense and immemorial cities lapsing shard by shard, atom by atom, to feed infinities of desolation. I dragged my torture-weakened limbs over vast rubbish heaps that had once been mighty temples, and fallen gods frowned in rotting passamite, or leered in riven porphyry at my feet. Over all was an evil silence, broken only by the satanic laughter of hyenas, and the rustling of adders in thickets of dead thorn or antique gardens given to the perishing nettle and fumitory. Topping one of the many mound-like ridges, I saw the waters of a weird lake, unfathomably dark and green as malachite, and set with bars of profulgent salt. These waters lay far beneath me in a cup-like hollow, but almost at my feet on the wave-worn slopes were heaps of that ancient salt, and I knew that the lake was only the bitter and ebbing dregs of some former sea. Climbing down, I came to the dark waters, and began to lave my hands, but there was a sharp and corrosive sting in that immemorial brine, and I desisted quickly, preferring the desert dust that had wrapped me about like a slow shroud. Here, I decided to rest for a while, and hunger forced me to consume part of the meagre and mocking fare with which I had been provided by the priests. It was my intention to push on, if my strength would allow, and reach the lands that lie to the north of Yondo. Now, these lands are desolate indeed, but, but their desolation is of a more usual than that of Yondo, and certain tribes of nomads have been known to visit them occasionally. If fortune favoured me, I might fall in with one of these tribes. Well, the scant fare revived me, and for the first time in weeks of which I had lost all reckoning, I heard the whisper of a faint hope. 
corpse-coloured insects had long since ceased to follow me, and so far, despite the eeriness of the sepulchral silence and the mounded dust of timeless ruin, I had met nothing half so horrible as those insects. I began to think that the terrors of yonder were somewhat exaggerated. It was then that I heard a diabolic chuckle on the hillside above me. The sound began with a sharp abruptness that startled me beyond all reason, and continued endlessly, never varying its single note, like the mirth of an idiotic demon. I turned and saw the mouth of a dark cave, fanged with green stalactites, which I had not perceived before. The sound appeared to come from within this cave. With a fearful intentness, I stared at the black opening. The chuckle grew louder, but for a while I could see nothing. At last I caught a whitish glimmer in the darkness. Then, with all the rapidity of nightmare, a monstrous thing emerged. It had a pale, hairless, egg-shaped body, large as that of a gravid she-goat, and this body was mounted on nine long, wavering legs with many flanges, like the legs of some enormous spider. The creature ran past me to the water's edge, and I saw that there were no eyes in its oddly sloping face, but two knife-like ears rose high above its head, and a thin, wrinkled snout hung down across its mouth, whose flabby lips, parted in that eternal chuckle, revealed rows of bat's teeth. It drank acidly of the bitter lake, then, with thirst satisfied, it turned and seemed to sense my presence, for the wrinkled snout rose and pointed toward me, sniffing audibly. Whether the creature would have fled, or whether it meant to attack me, I do not know, for I could bear the sight no longer, but ran with trembling limbs amid the massive boulders and great bars of salt along the lake shore. Utterly breathless, I stopped at last, and saw that I was not pursued. I sat down, still trembling, in the shadow of a boulder. But I was to find little respite, for now began the second of those bizarre adventures which forced me to believe all the mad legends I had heard. More startling even than that diabolic chuckle was a scream that rose at my very elbow from the salt-compounded sand. The scream of a woman possessed by some atrocious agony, or helpless in the grip of devil. Turning... I beheld a veritable Venus, naked in a white perfection that could fear no scrutiny, but immersed to her navel in the sand. Her terror-widened eyes implored me, and her lotus hands reached out with beseeching gesture. I sprang to her side and touched a marble statue whose carved lips were drooped in some enigmatic dream of dead cycles, and whose hands were buried with the lost loveliness of hips and thighs. Again... I fled, shaken with a new fear, and again I heard the scream of a woman's agony. But this time I did not turn to see the imploring eyes and hands. Up the long slope to the north of that accursed lake, stumbling over boulders of bassinite and ledges that were sharp with verdigris-covered metals, floundering in pits of salt, on terraces wrought by the receding tide in ancient eons, I fled as a man flies from dream to baleful dream of some cocker demonical night. At whiles, there was a cold whisper in my ear, which did not come from the wind of my flight. And looking back, as I reached one of the upper terraces, I perceived a singular shadow that ran pace by pace with my own. This shadow was not the shadow of man or ape, nor any beast. Oh, the head was too grotesquely elongated, the squat body too gibbous and I was unable to determine whether the shadow possessed five legs or whether what appeared to be the fifth was merely a tail. Terror lent me new strength, and I'd reached the hilltop when I dared to look back again. But still the fantastic shadow kept pace by pace with mine, and now I caught a curious and utterly sickening odour, as foul as the odour of bats who've hung in a charnel house amid the mould of corruption. I ran for leagues, while the red sun slanted above the asteroidal mountains to the west, and the weird shadow lengthened with mine, but always kept at the same distance behind me. An hour before sunset I came to a small circle of pillars that rose miraculously unbroken amid ruins that were like a vast pile of potsherds. As I passed among these pillars, I heard a whimper, 
like the whimper of some fierce animal, between rage and fear, and saw that the shadow had not followed me within the circle. I stopped and waited, conjecturing at once that I had found a sanctuary my unwelcome familiar would not dare to enter, and in this the action of the shadow confirmed me. The thing hesitated, then ran about the circle of columns, pausing often between them, and whimpering all the while, at last went away and disappeared in the desert toward the setting sun. For a full half hour, I did not dare to move. Then the imminence of night, with all its probabilities of fresh terror, urged me to push on as far as I could to the north. For I was now in the very heart of yonder where demons or phantoms might dwell, who would not respect the sanctuary of the unbroken columns. Now, as I toiled on, the sunlight altered strangely, for the red orb nearing the mounded horizon sank and smouldered in a belt of miasmal haze, where floating dust from all the shattered fanes and necropoly of yonder was mixed with evil vapours coiling skyward from the black, enormous gulfs lying beyond the utmost rim of the world. In that light, the entire waste, the rounded mountains, the serpentine hills, the lost cities were all drenched with phantasmal and darkening scarlet. Then, out of the north, where shadows mustered, there came a curious figure, a tall man, fully caparisoned in chainmail, or rather, what I assumed to be a man. As the figure approached me, clanking dismally at each step on the shrouded ground, I saw that his armour was of brass mottled with verdigris, and a cask of the same metal furnished with coiling horns and a serrate comb rose high above its head. Now, I say its head for the sunset was darkening, and I could not clearly see at any distance. But when the apparition came abreast, I perceived that there was no face beneath the brows of the bizarre helmet whose empty edges were outlined for a moment against the smouldering light. Then the figure passed on, still clanking dismally, and vanished. But on its heels, the sunset faded, and there came a second apparition, striding with incredible strides and halting when it loomed almost upon me in the red twilight. The monstrous mummy of some ancient king still crowned with untarnished gold, but turning to my gaze a visage that more than time or the worm had wasted. Broken swathings flapped about the skeleton legs, and above the crown that was set with sapphires and orange rubies, a black something swayed and nodded horribly. But for an instant... I did not dream what it was. Then, in its middle, two oblique and scarlet eyes opened and glowed like hellish coals, and two ophidian fangs glittered in an ape-like mouth. A squat, furless, shapeless head on a neck of disproportionate extent leaned unspeakably down and whispered in the mummy's ear. Then, with one stride, the titanic lake took off the distance between us, and from out the folds of the tattered seer cloth a gaunt arm rose, and fleshless, taloned fingers laden with glowing gems reached out and fumbled for my throat. Back, back through eons of madness and dread, in a prone, precipitate flight, I ran from those fumbling fingers that hung always on the dust behind me. Back, back forever, unthinking, unhesitating, to all the abominations I had left. Back in the thickening twilight toward the nameless and sharded ruins, the haunted lake, the forest of evil cacti, and the cruel and cynical inquisitors of Ong, who waited my return. So there you go, everyone. Your Friday evening's entertainment was three old-school classics. Now, um, I've been doing a few of these recently, and a lot of you seem quite happy about the fact that I'm doing them, so here you go again. <laughs> Did you like that extra footage of me between each of the stories tonight? Lovely work, isn't it? Check out the artist in the video description. Um, really, really brilliant work, and I'm eternally grateful for it, and being able to use it on the channel here. Well... That is enough for me for this evening. Um, I asked you to vote on your favourite title of one of the longer stories that's coming up. I think um, it was quite emphatically in favour of the uh, 
discovered a new island in uh, wherever it was. Where was that new island? Anyway, that one, that long one. It's going to be between three and a three and a half hours long. And um, I'm two thirds of the way through recording it. Um, might come up on Sunday. If not, that's going to be on Monday. So you've got another monster, monster long story coming up very soon. Well, that's enough for me for one evening, but I will be back again very soon. I do so hope you're going to join me again. Till the next time, very, very sweet dreams, and bye-bye.